morning. Is there supposed to be a red light on here? <laughs> we'll, we'll get it together. Just hold on. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, um, welcome to the First Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls. I am not Pastor Leah. Um, and um, I wanted to make a few announcements. This has been a busy weekend. Um, we started on, on um, Friday with the, the fish fry, and we still have things left over from the fish fry. There we go. Um, so there's some things downstairs, uh, some pies and some cookies, I know, at least. So you might want to stop by there if you, <laughs> if you still have uh, a need for that. Um, the Fix-It Cafe yesterday, we did fix some things. We didn't have anybody come in from other places. Um, so we'll do it again another month and we'll just let people realize that, oh yeah, we could get this fixed. We don't have to throw out our toaster. We might be able to get it fixed. So there's, there's a possibility there. But you know, if you're going to involve the Asowskis in anything, and Stu was one of our fix-it people, though I don't know if you ever had to use your duct tape or Gorilla Glue, did you? No. <laughs> Um, you're going to eat, because Kathy showed up with a plate of her sliders that some of you got to try uh, a few months ago, and um, macaroni salad, and a vegetable plate, and a fruit plate, and so you guys all missed it if you didn't come by. We had a good time <laughs> for three hours of uh, fixing things. Um, and I wanted to give you a, an update on... Um, somebody that's in our prayer list um, because most of the time unless there's a name that you're familiar with you have no idea who these people are or why they're on the prayer list my sister Cherie Murphy has been on the prayer list for a couple of years now because she's in kidney failure she's been on dialysis for over a couple of years and um, that's been going as well as it can um, a few months ago, she got a phone call that said, we have a kidney for you. Unfortunately, about 15 minutes before that phone call, there had been a phone call that's, that was a follow-up from a back doctor's appointment that she'd gone to because she, wasn't feel, she was feeling worse than usual. Um, and they said, uh, your blood work shows that you have bone marrow cancer. So she couldn't take that kidney. And that was kind of a kicking the teeth. Um, then she spent a week, a couple of weeks ago, she was in the hospital with pneumonia, and it's like, oh my God. So we don't know how this is gonna turn out, but um, prayers need to continue, is what I'm saying. I think that kidney came along because of the prayer. The other stuff, maybe not so much. Uh, and Matt, you said you had somebody you wanted to add to the prayer list? Who? Well, that'll do. <laughs> um, she works out at Margarita's out. She actually is the owner and chef for Margarita's out at the mall. We ended up finding out she has a very, very bad deadly disease um, that's attacking her body. And she got on four different types of medications that she did not have to worry about. Um, her sister in law and her brother both came to me and said, Can you please? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, okay, then Mama E, let's just call it that. Okay, um, so let us uh, call ourselves to worship. Join me in be welcoming, be compassionate, be you bravely, be community. And join me for the call to worship. For those who have not been welcomed before, you are welcomed by Christ here. For those who have been turned away, Christ is opening the door for you. For those who have been forgotten, God cannot forget you, for God made you. 
Come, then, join together in worship of our God. You are God's beloved. You welcome each other in the name of Christ. Amen. Gracious God, your gifts to us are boundless. Life and liberties, vibrant color and melodious sounds, forgiveness and your divine presence, intelligence and creativity, work and worship, love and compassion. There is no end to your goodness and generosity toward us, and we thank you. We offer these gifts in response to all that you have shared with us, for we always and only give you what is already yours. Amen. If you haven't made your gift when you came in, then um, do it on your way out. Join me in the prayer of confession. O oh, you who are the life of souls, having life in yourself, O oh, lift up my soul. It is a good thing to make my confession unto you, O oh, God of my heart. And say, have mercy upon me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. And let me never abuse your mercy and take it for a license to sin. But remember your words. Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto you. For who are you, O God, but the very wellspring of righteousness, who renders to every one of us according to our works, and a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. Peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The peace of God be with you and also with you. For sure, <laughs> let's, get, let's get this done. a new one for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but it was nice. 
please be seated. Except the children, they might want to come and look at this display here of what is this mess. Um, there's a lot of sporting equipment that my granddaughter dug out of their garage. Um, and and um, do you think that everybody in your family needs one of these? You think you all need the one? So four basketballs for the Garino. Maybe there are some that you do need your own, like a softball mitt or a baseball mitt. Um, and maybe you've got your own special bat, but you probably don't all need a basketball. And soccer, you know, probably one for the family would do. You can share these things and, and have an assortment of them. And um, back in the, the day of the first Christians, nobody really owned anything. They shared everything. Um, there was no private ownership. Um, everything was held in common. Um, what's a good thing about that kind of sharing? What do you think? Are you saying anything? Because I can't hear anything. She's not saying anything. She's just thinking, huh? I still can't hear you, sweetie. Yeah, you all benefit, and you don't all have to have those things. It doesn't make up as much room. Everybody gets to, to share in whatever it is that you have. Um, but in today's world, we just can't, I mean, we can't share everything. I guess maybe there are too many of us or things are, are too busy or we have individual homes, um, uh, but we do share things. Uh, um, we, if we outgrow our clothing, maybe we take it to the house of concern. Um, we bring in food here every, every month or whatever is being asked for. Um, to take to the house of concern. Um, you probably would help out your neighbors if they, they needed something. Um, we're going to have a community garden here in Seneca Falls so that people who maybe would like to be able to grow vegetables but don't really have the space can get some space there or just go and find out how to do this so that you can do it next year. Um, so uh, sharing, sharing things uh, we do, but we don't do it the way that the early Christians did. And God has always expected us to share from the first days of the church. In fact, he shared Jesus with us, so that was the, the biggest share of all, I guess. And um, now, I guess we should have uh, Michelle come up and enlighten us further. Well, please listen as I share the prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Come to bring light even to those corners of our lives where we prefer shadows and secrets. Come to speak truth, even though we are partial to our illusions. Come to give us life, even though we stubbornly resist it. Come, Holy Spirit, to open the word of grace to us. For the sake of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first testament is from Exodus 23 through 11. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. 
You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slaves, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. The words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The second testament this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. And we're jumping into the middle of a story here. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life is filled with choices. Do you take a nap or cut the grass? Do you write a letter or make dinner? Do you speak up or say quiet? Do you fight or do you wait on the Lord? Of course, the most important choice is, do I follow Christ or go my own way? For some reason, the Jewish religious leaders in the time of Jesus chose to oppose him rather than follow him. They chose to hold on to their little slice of power rather than surrender to his lordship. And before we condemn them, let's be honest enough to admit that we often do the same thing. It should not surprise us that these same religious leaders spent time debating which of the 613 laws in the first five books of the Bible was the most important. It was a spirited debate, kind of the way Christians debate details about the end times today. It is into this debate that they seek to involve Jesus. Unlike the other questions, like those on authority or taxes, the resurrection, it's hard to know what the Pharisees hoped to gain by testing Jesus with this question. <laughs> Did they believe Jesus would not be up to a scholarly debate? Did they hope to ridicule him as one lacking the knowledge to lead others? It's hard to know. All we know for sure is Jesus was ready for them. Let's look at the text I just read. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadduc Sadducees in his reply, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. The Pharisees had sent a scholar to talk with Jesus, 
and he was armed with information and certainly felt like he could easily win a debate with this uh, uneducated carpenter. But Jesus completely unraveled the scholar with an answer as simple as it was profound. He quoted Deuteronomy. It was a statement every devoted Jew repeated daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. In other words, the answer to the question was on the lips of every Jewish person. The question the scholar thought was going to be so difficult was actually pretty elementary. I guess we know who looked like they were educated beyond their intelligence. Karl Barth was a well-known and respected theologian. He had written many books. One day in 1962, he was at Rockefeller Chapel on the campus of the University of Chicago. During the question and answer time after his lecture, a student asked Barth if he could summarize his whole life's work in theology in one sentence. Barth said something like, yes, I can. In the words of a song that I learned at my mother's knee, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus did not stop at that most important commandment. He also told the scholar the second most important commandment, which was found in Leviticus. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. We're going to look at both of those commandments more closely, but notice that the first commandment has to do with our vertical relationship with God, and the second with our horizontal relationship with each other. These two are always tied together. If we are in right relationship with God, it will impact the way we react to one another. Let's look at these greatest of commandments, but before we do, let's clear something up. R.C. Spruill writes, there is a widely held idea in the Christian world that all of the laws of God hold equal weight. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is the teaching of James, who writes, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. However, James does not mean that when we violate one point of the law, we thereby violate every particular law. Moreover, there are frequent instances in scripture where gradations of sin are set forth. God considered certain laws so important that he specified that violations of them deserve the death penalty, but he did not require such grave penalty for other laws. Obviously, therefore, the prohibition against murdering a human being was of greater importance than the prohibition against boiling a goat in its mother's milk. Who does that? Um, I can't imagine. Even Jesus recognized a hierarchy of laws, and he said, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. To summarize, all the laws of God are significant, but they are not equally important. A violation of God's command is always sin, but there are degrees of sin. Jesus said the most important command was to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, God wants us to love him fully. Do you remember when you were first really in love? You couldn't stop thinking about that person. You talked about them constantly. In fact, you would find ways to bring them up in conversations that had nothing to do with them. If you had a chance to spend time with them, you would completely rearrange your schedule so you could do that. You looked for ways to show them 
how much you cared about them. I think this is the way God wants us to feel about him. When you first become a parent, you would find yourself standing next to your baby's crib completely mesmerized by that sleeping surprise of joy, particularly when they're asleep, Jen, just warning you. Um, you watched them breathe and you were filled with wonder. You found yourself making noises and carrying on without any concern at all for what other people were thinking about all your babbling. God wants us to be this much in love with him. Few of us would say we love God with that kind of compassion. Sadly, we don't feel bad about it because we don't know when else loves God this completely either. But here's the question. Why don't we feel this way about the Lord? Who is more wonderful than he is? Who has changed our lives more completely? Who else speaks words of comfort and instruction to us? Who else knows us better than we know ourselves and yet still loves us? I suspect there are several reasons we don't love him as we should. First, we don't truly know him. We have a passing knowledge of him. We know enough, we believe, to get by. Maybe we feel we know enough to get into heaven. We have settled for crumbs when the main course is before us. Second, we have taken him for granted. God does not push us away like so many other demands in our lives because he is spirit, he's easy to dismiss and we feel like he's always there, so there's no big hurry to love uh, and know him. It's not like one of our highest priorities because, well, um, we have all of eternity to know and love him and praise him and honor him. What we overlook is how he seeks to enrich and deepen us right now. As we walk with him, we find that problems are easier to manage. He gives us strength that we often lack. In addition, walking with him is delightful. The day is more beautiful. People are more fascinating. Knowledge is more captivating. He reveals treasures in life that we would overlook without him. He guides us away from the landmines and the foolish decisions of life. He uses us to do things we never dreamed we could do. This is the point Paul was trying to make when he wrote, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to fully understand, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. When we think about love, we are usually talking about feelings or emotions. Maybe that would be the equivalent of heart love. However, when we add soul and mind, we are reminded that love is also a decision. We certainly don't feel like loving our enemy, but we can choose to do so. We may not love God fully, but we can choose to do so. If we made the most important commandment, the goal of our lives, it would revolutionize us and it would have a ripple effect on those around us we would be content to let him fight our battles. We would be confident he could rebuild what was broken. We would sleep without worry. We would worship without inhibition. We would tell others about him regularly because we would be quick to brag about him. We would pursue him with all our strength because He's the one most worth pursuing. We would turn to him with our needs because 
we know there's no better place to turn. We would reach out to others, confident God would use us for good in their lives. We would view death as our graduation day. That's an interesting concept. And all of us, all of this when we start working on loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus recognized that a true love for God will impact the horizontal relationship we have with others. We can't truly love God if we do not love those whom he loves. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. <coughs> you have probably heard people say that before we can love others, we need to learn to love ourselves. And they use this text as an encouragement to positive self-esteem. One commentator writes perceptively, let us not debate whether Jesus here commands self-love, nor let us discuss people who dislike themselves. Even those who dislike themselves love themselves. They lavish attention on themselves, on their efforts to feel better or to justify their misery. So, Jesus says, attend to your neighbor's good as you do to your own. As you fuss over your cuts and blemishes, over bad pillows, bad reports about your word, so fuss over your neighbor's soul. It's not about caring for yourself more. It's about caring for others in the same way you care about yourself. It's about giving priority to the needs of others, giving them the benefit of the doubt, extending forgiveness, grace, and mercy. It means we try to love others as the Lord has loved us. C.S. Lewis's words about humility certainly apply here. He says, it's not about thinking less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. Kind of an interesting, not about thinking less of yourself, thinking of yourself less. We can't love other people if all we're concerned about is ourselves. Let's be honest. Much of the time, the loving acts we do might be self-serving. We hope or we plan to get something in return. And if we do not, what we call love turns quickly into bitterness or hatred. When we give to get, we are not really giving at all. We are negotiating or worse, manipulating. To truly love others, you must first see their value. We need to see the image of God in the people around us. We must get it through our heads so it will eventually impact our emotions. Each person is valuable in God's sight. We start the process of love when we look for the treasures in others. We may have to dig for it, but it's there when we focus on the value rather than the weaknesses we have begun to love. Second, you need to be alert for pain. There is pain in every life. When you see someone's pain and then stand with them in that pain, you show a love that will not quickly be forgotten. Most of the distasteful behavior we see from others is rooted in pain. If you look for the pain you will find a doorway to the true person. Third, the kind of love Jesus commands is a love that goes beyond barriers. Frederick Buckner wrote, the love for equals is a human thing, friend for friend, brother for brother. It is to love what is loving and lovely. The world smiles. 
The love for the less fortunate is a beautiful thing. The love for those who suffer, for those who are poor, the sick, the failures, the unlovely. This is compassion, and it touches the heart of the world. The love for the more fortunate is a rare thing. To love those who succeed where we fail, to rejoice without envy with those who rejoice, the love of the poor for the rich. The world is always bewildered by its saints. And then there is the love for the enemy. Love for the one who does not love you, but mocks, threatens, inflicts pain. The tortured, the tortured's love for the torturer. This is God's love, and it conquers the world. When we can love even those who have hurt us, we begin to love as God has loved. It's easy to forget we have rebelled, rebelled against God. By all rights, he should send us away. He should cast us off as his children, but he doesn't. The proper motivation for loving others is our gratitude to God for loving us. This is why it is important to face our sinful nature squarely. When we see the depth of our sin, we are set free to understand and appreciate his mercy and grace. When we treat each other with that same kind of love, when we see the potential rather than the pain, when we give the benefit of the doubt rather than assuming the worst possible motives, we are loving like he does. Following God does not require a scholarly degree. The scholars believed that you had to know much before you were a true follower. Jesus said, it's not that complicated. The gospel message boils down to two simple truths. God deserves and requires our love and devotion. We have not given him what he deserves, and now we deserve hell. The only way we can overcome our sin is through the sacrifice of Jesus. When we repent, regret and confess our sin, turn to Christ as the only one who can save us, and then set out to follow him, we are members of God's family. Here's the point. You can stop putting off following the Lord because you don't know more. Instead, embrace what you do know and begin to grow your relationship with God. He is much more concerned about you knowing him than he is about how many facts you've gathered. How do we start following him? The first step is to repent of our failure to obey these commands. We must acknowledge that we have not loved God as we should, not even close. We also have not loved others in the same way we love ourselves. We must deal with the sin before we can move forward. Be honest with God and confess. Second, try to imagine how life would be different if we obeyed those two most important commandments that God has given to us. How would it change our lives if we pursued him with a passion that could not be abated? What if we loved him more than our sports teams, our hobbies, our trinkets, even all these things we claim as our rights? What if we desired him more than um, ice cream on a hot day or that first cup of coffee in the morning? What if we longed for him with a longing that captivated our every thought? What if we did everything in life with the desire to please and honor him? What would happen if we persistently choose love over fear, judgment, or competition toward each other? What if we loved one another the way Jesus loves us? What if we stopped demanding from others and started to give to them? What if we looked for the hurt rather than the weakness we could exploit? Imagine, and then do what you imagine. 
It seems impossible, but Jesus died to set us free. He died so the impossible would be possible. He died so the Holy Spirit could live in us, guide us, and transform us. He died so we could know God in his richness and glory. It is time to start moving in that direction. In other words, the way to begin is begin. It is time to start truly pursuing God and his heart for those around us. It is not nearly as complicated as we might think. Amen.
really like that one. Um, you may be seated. And join me in this time of prayer. Loving God, grateful for the celebrations of life for the gathering of our church families and for the joy of welcoming new members to our worshiping family, we give you thanks for the gift of water, which we especially need right now, Lord, especially as it comes to us bringing the gift of life in you. We offer our prayers of thanksgiving. We thank you for our children who cause us to dig deep for patience and fill us with joy overflowing. We thank you for our youth who stand firm in their faith and also question our beliefs in an attempt to make their beliefs their own. Keep us mindful, we pray, of the gift of your presence when we travel through difficult days and treacherous paths and when the way before us is unclear. Help us to remember that there is no tragedy beyond the reach of your love which never lets us go, as evidenced by the life of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, there will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let your lives witness to Christ's love. Let your words bring reconciliation. Let your thoughts be of peace. Let your touch bring healing. Let your actions count for justice. Be a sign of hope and a beacon of joy. Go, and may God's blessing go with you. Amen.